Welcome to Objective 4.6. In this video, we'll explore how to implement and maintain identity and access management in real-world scenarios. We'll cover essential practices like user authentication, role-based access, and multi-factor authentication to ensure secure access control across your organization. Let's dive into managing identities and safeguarding access. Question 1. What is the primary purpose of deprovisioning in the context of identity and access management? A. Granting new permissions to users. B. Assigning roles to new users. C. Removing or disabling permissions and settings. D. Implementing single sign-on SSO. The answer is C. Removing or disabling permissions and settings. Removing or disabling permissions and settings is the primary purpose of deprovisioning. Question 2. What are implicit permissions in a digital environment? A. Permissions directly assigned by an administrator. B. Permissions granted through SSO. C. Permissions inherited through membership in a group or row. D. Permissions set for files only. The answer is C. Permissions inherited through membership in a group or row. Implicit permissions are permissions inherited through membership in a group or row. Question 3. What is the primary benefit of single sign-on? SSU. A. It increases the number of passwords a user has to remember. B. It reduces the number of authentication steps after the initial login. C. It enhances password complexity. D. It automatically assigns roles to users. The answer is B. It reduces the number of authentication steps after the initial login. SSO simplifies the user experience by reducing the number of authentication steps the user must complete after initially logging in. Question 4. How does role-based access control, RBAC, differ from mandatory access control, MAC? A. RBAC is controlled by the system while MAC is controlled by the owner of a resource. B. RBAC is controlled by the owner while MAC is controlled by the system. C. RBAC works with sets or permissions, while MAC works with individual label-based permissions. D. RBAC works with individual permissions, while MAC works with sets of permissions. The answer is C. RBAC works with sets or permissions, while MAC works with individual label-based permissions. RBAC works with sets of permissions based on a role in the company, whereas MAC works with individual label-based permissions. Question 5. What is one reason for recommending longer passwords? A. Longer passwords are easier to remember. B. Longer passwords increase the chance of successful brute force attacks. C. Longer passwords reduce the likelihood of successful brute force attacks. D. Longer passwords are less secure. The answer is C. Longer passwords reduce the likelihood of successful brute force attacks. Longer passwords are inherently more secure than shorter ones, reducing the likelihood of successful brute force or dictionary attacks. Question 6. What is the main goal of just-in-time JIT permissions in a privileged access management system? A. To maintain elevated permissions at all times. B. To dynamically provision permissions for a limited period. C. To increase the number of permissions. D. To permanently assign roles to users. The answer is B, to dynamically provision permissions for a limited period. JIT permissions are dynamically provisioned access permissions that are typically granted for a limited period and align specifically with the time frame during which the permissions are required. Question 7. Why is interoperability particularly important in identity and access management IAM systems? A, to ensure faster data processing speeds. B, to allow for varied information systems and applications to connect exchange information seamlessly. C. To reduce the overall cost of the IT infrastructure. D. To increase storage capacity for user credentials. The answer is B. To allow for varied information systems and applications to connect exchange information seamlessly. Interoperability is particularly important in IAM systems to allow varied information systems and applications to connect and exchange information seamlessly. It facilitates system integration, enables secure business partnership, and allows for flexibility in adapting to new technologies and compliance requirements. Question 8. What is the primary purpose of attestation in the context of remote system authentication? A. To provide backup for system data. B. 
to enable one system to provide reliable statements about its software to another system. C. To facilitate anonymous web browsing. D. To decrease the time taken for user authentication. The answer is B. To enable one system to provide reliable statements about its software to another system. The primary purpose of attestation in remote system authentication is to enable one system to provide reliable statements about its software to another system. The other system can use these statements in making authorization decisions. Question 9. Which of the following is the best example of a something you know factor in multi-factor authentication? A. Fingerprint scan. B. SMS message sent to a phone. C. Passphrase or PIN code. D. Smart card. The answer is C. Passphrase or PIN code. A something you know factor in multi-factor authentication is knowledge-based evidence such as passphrase or PIN code. Question 10. In the context of MFA, what does a something you have factor refer to? A. The use of a user's physical characteristics for authentication. B. A user's memory of personal information. C. A personal ATM card for a user's checking account. D. The time it takes for a user to log in. The answer is C. A personal ATM card for a user's checking account. In MFA, a something you have factor is an object in the user's possession such as security token or smart card that is used for verification. Question 11. Which of these represents the best identity proofing option for a financial institution? A. Using only a username and a password for all transactions. B. Employing a multi-layer mechanism involving a password, two-factor authentication, and voice recognition for high-value transactions. C. Relying solely on periodic re-authentication. D. Implementing session timeouts without requiring re-verification. The answer is B. Employing a multi-layer mechanism involving a password, two-factor authentication, and voice recognition for high-value transactions. Employing a multi-layer mechanism involving a password, two-factor authentication, and voice recognition for high-value transactions is the best selection for sensitive transactions commonly found at a financial institution. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this information helpful as you prepare for your CompTIA Security Plus exam. Remember, the passing score for the Security Plus exam is 750 on a scale of 100, 900, so keep that in mind as you study. If you have any questions, comments, or tips of your own, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any future updates. Good luck on your exam, and see you next time.